Hello. Welcome to Movers, Shakers, Designers, Makers. I'm Steve Carpenter. I'm Dean of the College of Arts and Architecture here at Penn State. Today, I'm talking with Mark Schulman. Mark earned a Bachelor of Arts degree in Integrative Arts at Penn State in 1996. In 2010, Mark was recognized by the Penn State Alumni Association as an Alumni Achievement Award recipient. Now, this recognition is reserved for alumni who are under 35 years of age with exceptional career progression in their chosen field. And you should know that this award is also a lifetime designation. And although a bit of time has passed since uh, that award for Mark, the world has changed significantly uh, in that time period. And, um, but what has not changed is Mark's impact on the entertainment industry, largely focused on concert promotion. As I imagine you will see in this interview, Mark's professional life actually took root during his time here at Penn State when he was a student, as I like to say, back in the 1900s, when I was also a student. Today, he is, a, he is the Senior Vice President for Programming at UBS Arena, a state-of-the-art concert venue and the soon-to-be home of the New York Islanders in the National Hockey League. Mark, I am so interested in hearing more about your work. Welcome to Mover Shakers, Designers Makers, and thanks for being my guest today. Thanks, Steve. Absolutely. I'm really excited to be here. Always proud uh, of my Penn State ties and anything that uh, I can do to share uh, my story and how Penn State is such a big part of it and continues to be a really big part of it. To begin, let's let's go way back uh, again, like I like to say, in the 1900s, uh, but specifically in uh, the mid 1990s when you came to Penn State uh, to pursue a degree, uh, an undergraduate degree. Uh, you earned a degree in integrative arts. Uh, we all have had our own unique experiences and stories about why uh, we came to Penn State and what influenced our decisions on our educational path. I'm interested if you'd start off, Mark, to tell us about your path or, um, in other words, why, why Penn State? It's a great question because uh, I often look back myself on my decision why Penn State and uh, how it is that the 17 year old me chose uh, my decision for you know university really uh led me down uh you know a, a career uh, that i wouldn't have ever foreseen as where i would eventually be going um i'd gotten a taste of uh doing some television or uh, work our high school had a television studio i really enjoyed it so i came into penn state as a, a film major in college of communications mm -hmm. um and if you asked me at that time it was probably television or film or something along those lines and, uh, you know, the decision for Penn State versus any other, um, it really came down to, I just wanted that big school. I wanted a, a place that was a lot of opportunity, uh, a lot of different offerings, um, a, you know, a diverse uh, group of people where, uh, you know, I came from a big high school, so I wasn't looking, you know, some of those uh, smaller liberal arts colleges, they just sort of looked to me like big high schools. Like I wanted, I wanted that big campus. I wanted the big football team. Like, and to me, Penn State was uh, far and away the right choice. Um, I actually chose to go to Penn State before I ever visited it. Um, and uh, I, I sent, I think I sent my application in on a Monday and I got my acceptance on a Friday. And I said, I, I, I filled that thing out and mailed it back. And I was like, I'm in. And I, you know, I look back and I go, you know, so many, you know, kids and friends and visiting all these universities. And I just knew, I don't know what to say. I just knew it worked out for me. Could have not, you know, but I look at a lot of things and decisions that I made. And sometimes I go, yeah, that could have gone very differently. In this case, it couldn't have gone better. So, you know, whatever. I never visited any other colleges. I really just picked a school uh, based on what I knew about it. And when I walked in there, I was like, ah, oh, this is great. I think it was the summer after I'd already accepted, I was ready to go. Isn't that something? See, I've uh, done several of these interviews and you're not the first person to say, when I received the call or received word from Penn State, I was in. Uh, visit or not, uh, this place seems to have that effect on people. Uh, Apparently, you made a good choice. Uh, it has uh, really been amazing. I think that the community around Penn State grew on me even more as I got further in my career, as I met other Penn Staters, mm -hmm. as I uh, was able to utilize the network and reach out to other Penn Staters. Uh, you know, 
when I was a student, you know, we didn't have LinkedIn, emailing people wasn't so easy. So we knew there were some Penn Staters out there and you'd try to reach out to them, wasn't that easy. Now, um, I have a lot of communication. I've had students, I've had colleagues, all sorts of people reach out and send me notes. Uh, I've been involved with the New York City chapter of the Alumni Association, just really finding ways uh, to stay connected and stay involved. And I try very hard whenever possible to be accessible to students in their career path, or even if they just have questions or connections that I can make, because to me, that was something that really wasn't possible when I was in school. Um, I would, you know, I didn't have access to, you know, professionals in the industry. And now uh, I want to be that connection in any way that I can. That's great. It's a beautiful way to give back, uh, but also to honor what, uh, uh, what was given to you or afforded uh, for you as a student. So that, that's really special. Thanks. Really. So, um, Mark, the expectations we have for uh, big undertakings in our lives, whether we know they're going to be major or not, my experience is they've always had twists and turns, uh, unanticipated outcomes. Uh, I think of our own integrative arts students uh, and their experiences uh, where those degrees aren't necessarily cookie cutter, not in a negative sense, but in a way that, you know, you sort of know such and such a degree, there are certain expectations. Integrative arts is a different kind of degree, as you can, you can attest to, because they're individually personalized. And um, as an administrator, as dean, I'm always interested in receiving feedback about our degree programs. Uh, so I'm curious to learn, um, and I can't change anything in the past now, but I'm interested in learning um, what, what you got out of that integrative arts experience. You mentioned the Penn State experience, but what was it about that integrative arts experience um, that you might not have ex expected to get out of it uh, when, when you started? So when I started as a film major and I was about uh, maybe a month into school as a freshman and uh, I wandered into the hub one day and they were doing the student activity fair and I was that you know you know 18 year old kid fresh on campus I knew a few people but not that many um, and I was really interested in signing up getting involved with some organizations and I think I signed up for four or five, six things that day, just things that piqued my interest. And one of them was the university concert committee. I always liked going to concerts and I thought, you know, sure, I'll go work on a concert, why not? Um, and they called me and they said, hey, you know, we're doing a show with the B-52s in Rec Hall and we need stagehands and, uh, you know, can you show up on Sunday and uh, help, you know, set it up? And I said, sure, I'll go do it. And I worked like 20 hours that day uh, I got $20 and a t-shirt and I walked out of there. I was like, that is the greatest thing I've ever done in my life. Like I absolutely loved it. And from that point forward, and we talk about the Penn state experience, uh, it was anything. I, I joined up to go work on moving on. I started managing bands. I did sound in the clubs downtown. I, you know, anything that I could do to get involved with concerts and do more and more and more and gain that experience I did. My problem was pretty, pretty much by the end of my freshman year, I determined I don't want to be in film and television. I want to work in concerts. And this degree, which I'm working really hard in, really isn't going to take me to where I want to be. Mm -hmm. And I had taken a class um, uh, in contemporary uh, you know, pop music, and the professor was Bill Kelly. Mm -hmm. And uh, after I, remember, I was in the forum, and after class one day, I just went to the front and I kind of shared with him my conundrum. Like, I just, I didn't know. And he's like, well, are you familiar with integrative arts? Now, at the time, I had kind of heard there was a thing out there that was like, it was almost like a, the, you know, some lore of like, uh, there's a way to like make your own degree. And I was like, I didn't know who to go to, how to do it, whether it was real. Did they give out two of these? Like, I don't like, right. like how do you go do that? I didn't know. Some magical place exists on campus, right? Exactly. <laughs> now, and I look back at, the, you know, myself, I go, wow, what, what got me to go like, tell this professor this and we one of those giant you know 300 person classes it wasn't like we were in a small room but I went and I did it and you know that is where integrative arts and Penn State it's almost like you will get back out of it what you put into it I went and I I you know put myself out there and what came back was that small school experience which was he said let me teach you about integrative arts, make an appointment, come to my office, we'll sit down. And he worked with me to develop a curriculum. Let's figure out what classes to take. Let's do some independent study. Let's do internship. And um, what, 
you know, uh, with his mentorship and finding a way to do it, like that basically went and justified a degree that not only served me in an educational uh, sense, but also set me up that by the time that I left Penn State, I had two or three years of practical work experience that put me so far ahead. And that even while in school, I was recognizing that. I was saying, you know what, I'm going to come out of here in a place that's actually um, catered to my interest in my field with practical experience and, you know, hit the ground running. And, you know, I, it, it was hard. I worked a lot and a lot of long days and nights and weekends and well, didn't necessarily have as much fun as some of the other students. But, uh, but man, did I run out of there because I, in essence, had my first full-time job before I had graduated. That's amazing. So it, what I'm hearing is there was a program, a degree program set up this magical place that somehow exists somewhere that the professor knew about. So I, I hear about, you know, the opportunity was there, but there was some initiative behind that from, from your perspective, you had this itch or a, a spark or an idea and, and took a chance to ask that question. You, you're not quite sure how you to put your finger on why or what motivated you to ask, walk down that the stairs and talk to the professor, Bill Kelly, and ask that question, but you did, right? So it's this really interesting uh, meeting of opportunity and and uh, inspiration or idea is that, is that I, fair? I, absolutely. I mean, I think the you know for for most students, and it's not you know this is not a knock on anyone. This is reality. They don't necessarily know what they want to do for their career while they're in school. They're still exploring. They're trying out different areas uh, and seeing what resonates. I knew it was a bit of a gift that I had figured it out early, and I didn't want to squander that opportunity. Um, that I happened to be taking that class, that I met a professor who was such a tremendous advisor like Bill Kelly, um, that maybe was happenstance. I'm not sure if I'd walked up to him and he said he didn't really have an answer for me. I'm not really sure what happens. I don't know that I'm doing this today. I yeah. really don't know. Uh, and you know, all of those, there, there are a lot of choices along that path. And you know, uh, it takes you long. I, I, uh, I don't know that I always trust everything, but when I look back on it, there, do, there does start to become a certain comfort to, uh, you know, put yourself out there, work really hard. Um, and uh, especially now when you look at the opportunities that are out there, like a LinkedIn, like connecting with other uh, um, alumni or groups or uh, getting together and networking, that uh, doors open, you know, but you, you, you know, you have to go get it. Yeah, sitting back and waiting doesn't work very well. Yeah, the doors, the open doors don't come to you. You have to at least be prepared and ready to walk through them. You know, what you shared sounds like a bit of advice and you talked about some connections. We'll, we'll get, I want to ask you a question later about ad advice, but before I do, so building on that um, uh, experience at Penn State, an undergraduate, I'm interested now to think about your career story, right? So I love asking uh, guests on uh, Mover Shakers, Designers Makers to talk about their career story in their own words. I could read, you know, two pages of your story. I read pretty well, not super interesting, and it wouldn't be you telling your story. So if you could think about a 30,000 foot view of your journey post Penn State to what you're doing now with UBS Arena, I'd be really interested in hearing about that. Yeah, it's, it's, uh, it's a lot. Uh, I'll try to sum it up. And I say it's a lot only in that it's been a lot of shows uh, that in that time. Wait a minute, you're not going to tell us one by one by one each of the. <laughs> it's probably about 20,000 concerts. And I don't think I'm Are you serious. Yeah. 20,000 concerts. Yeah, because at, at times we were, you know, uh, overseeing as many as five, you know, three to 5,000 in a year. Um so yeah, and you, you, it, it's it's uh, it's huge, and you can always remember the biggest, uh, and uh, but how you get there, right? So you start off, and I was at Penn State, and I was really on um, the production side. I, mean, I started unloading trucks. I started dealing with sound and lights. Um, I then started working on moving on, which was great as a student activity, and I really got to handle a project. Um, there's a lot of times in my career that I look back and I go, I have no idea why people allowed me to do that. Uh, moving on to a degree is part of that um, because I really didn't know what I was doing. But, you know, we had an advisor and I, I you know, um, uh, 
Uh, my advisor was Carol German, and I don't think that she was going to let us go too far off the rails, but I was pretty determined. I think that uh, they tried to keep you in the box. It's a student activity. Here's what you can do. Please don't break out of the box. I was not comfortable with that box. Um, and in fact, moving on when I took over it, um, it started as a big outdoor, it was it used to be called Gentle Thursdays and it started in the 70s. And, you know, it was always handled by students and it had trunk, trunk, trunk. And it was actually in the hub ballroom. I don't think many people know that, that it was such a tiny event. It was just a series of about five or six bands that played in the hub ballroom for about 400 people. And it was, I was determined I'm going to get this thing back outside. And there wasn't much of a budget. And uh, I think it was before there was a student activity fee. There wasn't a whole lot of money flying around it. We had to go. I mean, I had to like speak to AT&T and various people to actually get sponsorship money. And, you know, I was busy upsetting the university because I was like trying to get money from Coke while it was a Pepsi campus and, you know, <laughs> until I eventually got them to give me some of that Pepsi money. You know, it's like, you know, but we had to do that. We had to scrap for every dollar to go do it. And we brought it outside. And now. What is it? It's, it's, it's horrible for me to say, was it uh, over 20 years later? It's still outside yeah. like so that move. And then it grew and grew and grew. And, you know, our goal became that we would run it until we were juniors and then hand it off to someone else. So mm -hmm. you could be around to help the next person carry it forward. And, and that has existed. So in learning projects like that, eventually landed me working at uh, Wolf Trap in DC at the amphitheater, the federal amphitheater, which was an amazing experience, but that was also the end of my production career. Uh, mm -hmm. After a summer that I worked a hundred shows in 90 days in DC heat, uh, I was done. Hey, uh, Mark, Mark, listen, I grew up in the DC area, we would go to Wolf Trap uh, freak often. Uh, it can get hot in yeah. the summer. And that place is wide open out in a big old field. My goodness. Uh, it's a great Beautiful. venue, but I'm with you on the heat and the amazing facility. My car's air conditioning was broken. I oh, mean, it, they wouldn't let us wear shorts. It was a hot summer. Oh, so uh, I quit all the jobs and I said, I want to move to New York. I want to be on the business side. Now, and that was a big transition. I was now out of college. I really didn't have any business training, but I had decided that I wanted to be making decisions. It was great. Doing production was amazing, but I wanted to be the one um, setting up the shows um, on the business side and letting the production managers go and actually physically make them happen. So I moved to New York and became an agent. And during that time, I worked with acts like uh, we did like Fleetwood Mac and the Black Crows and all, the, all these great acts. Um, and it wasn't too long doing that before I uh, realized that uh, I didn't want to be an agent. I wanted to be a promoter. So after about three years, I switched over to a company called Metropolitan, um, another great company and worked with the biggest acts that existed at the time. Um, and then that company and the consolidation eventually got bought and they uh, absorbed the assets and let go of all the employees. Um, and that company is now the biggest concert promoter in the world, Live Nation. Uh, they tried to hire me. Uh, they asked me to move to, you know, they kept asking, how do you feel about the Pacific Northwest? And I said, you know, what about New York? And uh, they, uh, they really just didn't have anything in New York for me. So I started getting phone calls from another gentleman named Randy Phillips. And he was like, we're starting this new company. Um, and it's called AEG. Mm -hmm. And I said, well, that's great, except you don't have any venues. You don't have any footprint. You know, what are we going to do? He said, well, go out and build a venue. Now, I just worked at a company where we couldn't really go. We didn't have funding to buy pens. Uh, all of a sudden, they was like, go build a venue. I was 26 years old. And it was like the light bulb went on ago. Hey, here's an opportunity. So we started AEG. There were eight of us. Um, it's now the second largest promoter in the world. It's, um, you know, five continents and doing, uh, you know, massive amounts of shows. Um, but that kicked off a new journey. And that journey involved not only promoting uh, large shows, but also venue development. And during that time, I, uh, I found architects, I found uh, real estate agents, I developed a site. We created the budget and uh, what would eventually become the Nokia Theater in Times Square opened two and a half years later. And when we talk about times in our career, you go, what made anyone think that this 26 year old could do it? Um, but we did. 
Mm -hmm. um, and that venue had a tremendous run. It went for about 15 years. Um, it still exists, but uh, it's now in someone else's hands. Mm -hmm. um, but rode that for a very long time. I mean, and uh, we built that office from eight employees up to, I believe, up to 250. Um, and that region from Maine all the way down to South Carolina doing thousands and thousands of shows a year in literally dozens of venues. Um, and, you know, along the way, just, uh, you know, big tours with artists like J. Cole or Wiz Khalifa uh, helped create the Global Citizen Festival in Central Park. And we did uh, Neil Young and the Foo Fighters uh, working, I uh, did, you know, my first Madison Square Garden shows, uh, you know, just um, tons of shows at Radio City. It's just, you, you look back on it and it's just, um, it's a wild ride. And, you uh, I had reached a point where it was a great company to be with and I was really enjoying it, but uh, I needed a change. You know? So uh, in February of 2020, I uh, called up and I said, I, I got to make a change, but I gave them, I gave five weeks notice. And I said, uh, let me transition all my accounts. Let me extend my agreements. Let's, let's, you know, I want to make sure that as I depart, uh, the company is well, uh, in a good place while I figure out what I want to do next. So that was about February 10th. And then my final day was March 20th of 2020. And when I walked into that office to turn in my key card and my computer, it was dark. Uh, the entire company had shut down. Um, it was me and an HR person. I handed them my computer and my key. And that was my exit after 17 years. Uh, there was no pizza party. There was no nothing. The industry was shut down. Every concert was canceled. Yeah. Uh, so that was, uh, that was, it was an interesting year in 2020 to say the least And my timing, uh, good or not. Um, it's led me to another place, you know, yes. so, uh, an opportunity came up to, uh, work with a new group. This is Oakview Group, and it's headed up by two industry titans, Tim Laiwicki and Irving Azoff. And uh, they're building arenas all over the world. And one of them is at Belmont Park in Long Island. Um, it's going to be the home of the Islanders. We're going to open on November 20. And it's a $1.25 billion arena. And it is, it's spectacular. It's a tremendous new building. And that was, you know, in looking for, you know, what the, what's the next chapter? What's the next adventure? It was like, you know, I, I head up all the, basically all the programming except the Islanders. So everything else that happens in there. And now I'm expanding from beyond just concerts into college basketball, UFC, uh, mm -hmm. WWE, uh, family events and monster trucks and everything, everything else that happens in an arena. And uh, that it's been great. Um, it, it's been very hard to build a team and build an arena when you're actually doing it almost entirely remotely. I mean, we have spent nine, 10 months and I had coworkers I've been working with for the better part of a year, I'd never met in person. Right. And now we're uh, right on the precipice here of uh, just a huge new chapter, reshaping the entire New York marketplace with this tremendous new space for seeing live shows that now is going from a health and wellness standpoint has now been built in a post-COVID era, in a time after the pandemic, or at least during the pandemic, but with those uh, um, measures in place that we do have uh, enhanced HVAC, antimicrobial surfaces, uh, uh, all sorts of amazing technologies uh, where you're going to be able to, instead of those typical belly up concession stands, mm -hmm. uh, where you wait in line with 10 people waiting to get your hot dog um, with markets where you're going to go in, you tap a credit card, you take whatever you want, you just walk out, no cashier. Um, it's amazing new technology. It's going to change the way that we do um, you know, all of the, all of the old stadiums, all the old arenas, everyone's going to be forced to up, upgrade and update. And we are, in this actually amazing position of being able to design and open and uh, engage with this uh, from the start. And that, that's exciting. I mean, that, that's the kind of thing where you go, you know, the concerts were amazing, but after you've done, you know, I don't know, 20,000, mm -hmm. um, they do start to meld together into one. And now you go, now this is, this is really cutting edge. This is the yeah. next chapter. I'm, I'm just uh, taken by so much of what, what you said, um, not the least of which is this new arena and the, and the technologies. Help, help me understand this. So you had 
the plan was to have these new technologies before the pandemic, or was it as a result of, or in, in concert with, no pun intended, the pandemic to put these new technologies uh, in, in place in this new, in this new arena? I, there, the, the base technology for most of these elements, whether it was fully digital tickets and things like that, they, they've all been there, mm -hmm. but there wasn't really the, um, the driver the thing that was going to force them into these designs where people looked at them, they thought maybe, or sometime in the future, now they became no longer optional. Mm -hmm. um, that, and if we were going to open an arena, the, the most technologically advanced, what we call a third generation arena, uh, we were going to open with it from day one. And uh, now we're uh, about to uh, deliver on that promise. And in fact, we as a company are opening the new arena in Seattle one month earlier. They're opening in the middle of October, uh, featuring a lot of these same technologies. So uh, it's as you're operating or if you're in an older facility that wasn't really built for it or you have a, an existing customer base was all you know used to doing things a certain way there can be a lot of friction to making that change here we have the benefit of starting from scratch and saying everyone who steps at foot into this arena you're going to come with uh this new uh technological capability both yourself through your through your phone and also what we're able to provide on site it also comes with vaccination checks and uh, health monitoring and uh, employees and <clears throat> how we handle ourselves backstage and how we engage with artists and staff and uh, guests. It's uh, it's a big responsibility. It's it's impressive. Uh, one of the one of the statements that I catch myself saying often is one that I learned uh, about twenty five years ago or so, and that is. Uh, culture is the way we do things around here. One of my mentors uh, taught me that phrase and I've been sharing that in the college. Sounds like this, this arena is going to uh, construct this new culture, a new culture of how we do things in large public spaces, in arenas and in places where people gather and they have to interact with, with each other, with um, um, transactions. Uh, uh, like you said, not, not only in front of the stage but backstage as well. So you're establishing a new culture for uh, entertainment spaces for public gathering spaces for arenas. Uh, it's, it's, it's quite, quite impressive. It's a new culture and it requires from within our organization, a culture of leadership mm -hmm. that we need to be, uh, um, have the fortitude to step forward in front of others and lead the way because, uh, in this time, if we're going to bring back live events and we're going to do it safely and we're going to do it sustainably, and that is sustainably not only in the sense of uh, continuing it down the line, but also um, with regard to the environment, that we have to recognize the impact that we have on the environment as large scale events that uh, we are aiming and we will be operating the first net carbon zero arenas in America, that that has to be a core tenant of our culture and that we're going to have to take a leadership stance on that. So absolutely. Uh, and if we do not have that within our organization from top to bottom, uh, we won't achieve the goals. Uh, yeah. there, there, there's large obstacles to overcome, but we can. That, that's the nature of culture is the way we, we do things around here, not the way that we tell you to do things around here, right? So uh, I, I hear you. Uh, and that future is uh, where, where we're in it, uh, that that next phase, uh, we are in it. I'm, I'm really struck also by, um, you know, your experience with moving on. And, and you said, look, uh, you're trying to, you're put inside a box and pushed out and you, you were essentially trying to redefine the either the boundaries of the box or negate the, the presence of the box at all. Um, I, I would argue that you took some of that sensibility from, from the move of moving on from indoors back outdoors through your career and to, to this new work that you're doing. Is that, is that a fair uh, assessment? Yeah, no question. I mean, early on uh, establishing a vision and then finding the steps to achieve the goal um, has always sort of been baked in. Uh, it's probably the earliest example in my career where I said, I'm going to go make this happen. Uh, I, have, I have learned along the way 
that there's probably better ways to do it than I did early in my career and early in my education. But that being said, uh, the tact remains the same. Yeah. yeah. Better ways, other ways, different ways. Uh, and you might not know about those other ways unless you had a baseline of what you did anyway, right? You have to sometimes just do it your way. And that becomes the, the point at which you uh, reference, reference other, other approaches. Um, I hear you. So you, you mentioned, uh, we were talking about the arena and uh, you know, just new protocols. I, I'm just really intrigued by this idea of having uh, vaccine checks and, and uh, within the technology of the building itself. Uh, for folks who are gonna watch this uh, interview at whatever moment that they watch it, we're talking now in September, 2021. Right, we're a year and a half after, like you said, you know, uh, 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 well, Broadway went dark, the entertainment world went went dark. Um, you know, that was eight weeks. I was eight weeks into being a dean, and and uh, it was time to to do this job from home. The conversations I've had with alumni like yourself over the past year and a half have all included these accounts of of the pan the pandemic. Uh, you've shared some from a professional standpoint, but. What about from a, a, a different, a personal standpoint, if, if you would like uh, uh, to share that with us? You know, it's been a bit of a challenge here for us and with the family, uh, trying to navigate public school, uh, having people, you know, the adults in the house doing their jobs and yet still try to be upbeat and, and, and exist within the face of a pandemic. So uh, can you share a little bit of your experience over that? Uh, and it's, it's ongoing. Definitely. And I think the effects of this are going to be felt for a very long time. I'm not sure we can even truly assess the impact on ourselves, but from a mental health standpoint and uh, different people had different reactions. I think that you saw some folks and who were very uncomfortable with the isolation or the lack of social interaction or in person versus some other people found that actually they kind of enjoyed it. Maybe not the reason that they got to, you know, have that isolation, but uh, preferred to slow down. I, I, it, for our family, uh, and I have twin 13 year old boys. And uh, it was challenging, but I don't like to overstate our challenge compared to others. We stayed healthy. Um, I actually feel quite a bit. I think the, the people who had children in very young, early development Mm -hmm. Not being in school, not having that social interaction, not being with uh, professional educators during their really formative years. Um, you know, I worry about kids that age. I feel bad for the kids who were seniors and didn't get to have their last year of high school. I feel bad for the freshmen who didn't get to have that college experience. I know four years may sound like a long time, sometimes five, right? But it's short. You blink, it's kind of over. You don't get to have it again. Uh, so, for all of those folks, I, I, I mostly feel for them. Um, when, we, uh, when we look back, I think that it'll be years before we can truly assess how it impacted different people in different ways. And it's not over. Uh, I know that we, have, we are much more open, um, but it's a very dynamic situation. It is, uh, the uncertainty remains. It's going to be with us for a long time. And that's something we discuss very often, which is that the protocols that we put in place to keep everyone healthy is because while some people may say maybe it's overboard, maybe you know the requirements and some of these layers of uh, health and wellness that we're putting in place may be uh, extreme for some, but at the same time, we don't know what's gonna be in four weeks and six weeks and six months. So we have to be prepared for everything. And that means that uh, if at the moment things are under control, it doesn't mean that when we put this event on sale in September and October for something next April, no one can tell you what next April looks like. That's right. And that's a whole new world for live events. And that included it's sports, it's Broadway, it's concerts, it's uh, everything that involves mass gathering. There's the differentiation between the indoors and outdoors. There's large events and small events, but uh, we need to operate responsibly. Uh, it has an impact on people, real people, 
they're not just, you know, they're not just numbers out there. You know, we, we, we're, we're face to face and, uh, you know, we have to think about our employees. Absolutely. Yeah. What's well, it's, uh, you know, it's literally life, life and death. Uh, and, um, uh, you know, the college of arts and architecture, where we have several performing arts disciplines, um, and events, moving some of those things uh, remote, canceling them, uh, postponing them, configuring. Um, you know, I talk often about that. Well, let's start with Plan B. Let's figure out what Plan B is, and then see if we can make Plan A work. Um, we're constantly. It sounds like you are too. You're talking about being in a constant state of temporary planning, um, where everything is is based on the context yet yet to come. So you have to be uh, flexible and uh, you can't just lock down into something. You really have to say, well, this is the best that we can plan for at the moment. And that's a difficult position for folks to, to be in, but we've been doing it long enough now that um, you would think it's comfortable or easier. And I, I don't think it's getting comfortable or easier, which just, it's ongoing. And I agree with you, it's gonna be with us for a while. Um, so, you know, parallel to COVID, Mark, I'm also interested in other aspects of our lives that have become more elevated because of COVID, or if not because of COVID, um, parallel with COVID in, in ways that maybe makes them more visible. I, and by that, I'm talking about um, racial injustice has become more visible, more publicly discussed, political discord and disagreement, climate change. There are other social and cultural issues um, how, how do those um, elements, and certainly there are others that I haven't mentioned, but those in particular, um, how do those overlap or intersect with, with what you do uh, in, in, in your work? So we as a company, um, well, I should say, well, I can just start with, uh, we as an arena organization, mm -hmm. um, really focused on diversity and inclusion in our hiring because we know that it's, it will start with our leadership and with our team. Um, and that we in the arts uh, hold a special place in our culture. And that the, whether it is the, uh, the creators or our, uh, um, the artists, the fans, everyone, um, it only becomes communal when it's fully inclusive. Mm -hmm. I was like, so we bring communities together. Mm -hmm. They may segment differently where different shows attract different people, but uh, we have a responsibility as the place where communities come together to make sure that we are welcoming and inclusive and safe for everyone. And that is a core. And when we speak of core tenants and we talk about uh, sustainability, we talk about health and wellness, diversity and inclusion is another one. And it's an area where in particular in the music business, um, it's been lacking. You know, I've, I, I have thought back through my career and as I've stood in rooms that were not diverse, full of industry leaders and said, well, why is this? And, um, you know, we can question whether it was systemic or whether those avenues existed or whether there was prejudice involved. I don't really know the answer other than in some ways that may not matter anymore. What matters is what we do forward. Um, unless we are dragging something with us forward, if we clean the slate and say, okay, we recognize that this is an issue and it's not something that we can fix overnight. But when we look at leadership, at senior leadership, and we say, how do we go and create more inclusive senior leadership that we need to go and uh, create avenues for a diverse set of employees to get the type of experience that five, 10, 15 years from now, they are now um, prepared to be leaders of these companies now and into the future. And that is something that is really happening. And I'm, I'm, I'm now when I look across the landscape, I go, you know what, and it, th this is, uh, this is happening. Mm -hmm. And maybe not as quickly as we'd all like it to, but you know, you can't, give someone experience overnight. You can educate them over a small period of time, but that is the beginning, that's the foundation. The experience takes time. And uh, it, it is, it's changing a lot. Um, 
as an industry, I think that we're moving forward well. And now when you go and you, if you go to the conferences, you go and you see what's happening and you, you go, you know, this, this is starting to feel more representative of the world on the outside, not our insular world on the inside. Uh, you know, I had to bust into the business uh, beyond like no one invited me in. You don't, you know, when I started, there were no ads in the paper, you know, there was no school to go to for it. Uh, but now we're starting to recognize that we need to create doorways for those who are interested to come through. And if we're not getting enough of the right candidates, we need to go and uh, ask that question of why. Um, I have a friend who is a uh, professor at Emerson um, and I did, a, um, I spoke to his class and we addressed that. Um, and, uh, you know, he and I are of similar age and both came into the business and, you know, he ran the, um, runs the Brooklyn hip hop festival. And, you know, we, we were both recalling what the business was and how we both broke into it. We did it in very different ways, but he had to do it as an entrepreneur. He had to create his own business. You know, I did have, I'd had the benefit of being able to find my way into an existing company. So how we both did it was different, but his path was harder. It truly was. Yeah. Because there's some groundbreaking or constructing as you go, whereas your path was a bit different, but certainly um, uh, I, I, I really appreciate, and I'd like to have another conversation at some point with you about, you know, what do those opportunities look like that we can put in front of students who might have these interests, whether it's arts entrepreneurship or, or some variation of integrative arts now, or, or even some other experience that, that doesn't exist. What, what are those skills, sensibilities, um, experiences that you can put in a smaller amount of time that sets people up to have successful uh, experiences uh, beyond. Um, I, I really, um, we, we, can, we can take that up some other, other time if you'd like, but um, I, I just find it intriguing to, to, think, to think in those ways. Um, uh, so, uh, and I, I appreciate your response to, to my question about, you know, the, the various social and cultural um, issues that uh, have emerged because what you're essentially saying is, uh, the, the, you know the, the business, and, and but your 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 company uh, essentially is having these conversations collectively. It sounds like there is a bigger conversation to be had, rather than this is an additional thing that might be on the side or a marginalized set of ideas. It's really more integrated in the ways in which not only we know we have to do this because it's on the checklist. No, we need to do this because this is what we need to do. That's right. I mean, we are building a company and we have that unique opportunity, right? Mm -hmm. um, it would be squandering that opportunity if we didn't uh, have those discussions about diversity inclusion, if we didn't have them about uh, environmental impact. Mm -hmm. um, it, it's, uh, it may not be important to everyone, but to us it is. And when we sit around a room and we all look at each other, we know that we can feel good because um, we are uh, moving forward on a path that we know is right. It's not easy, you know. It, it, it's and it's it, if if you're confident in what that vision is and your leadership is on the same page, mm -hmm. and you say we know that this may not be the easiest route. It may not be the least expensive route. It may not give us uh, maybe as quick of a, a result as others may, but we know that we're going to do these things because they're the right thing to do. And that's how we're going to build ourselves for the future. And we're gonna stand behind them because there's gonna be challenges ahead that's going to uh, put up roadblocks and say, you know what, maybe we're gonna put that one to a side for a minute and we'll come back to it and we have to say no. But to say that is core to what we do and that we're going to have to go and deal with whatever may come with that because the results um, will bear out. We need to be patient. We need to stick behind it and be confident. Absolutely. Yeah, those are the values that bind, bind the, the group and, and, and shape and form uh, what the company is about and what it, what it will be. Absolutely. Um, you know, it. There's some optimism I hear in, in what you're saying. What, what, are you, what are you optimistic about? What, what uh, developments in your work are exciting now? Oh, I think that what you saw in the pandemic, a true shutdown of the live arts, uh, we've seen disruption 
in most every area of our lives, uh, whether it's uh, how we communicate, how we uh, how we uh, um, conduct commerce, you know, or we go look at the the, you know, the record industry and uh, the the uh, the um, impacts on physical product and you know whether or not people were going to consume movies in the same way. Um, I think movie theaters may never come back, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. But live, there was no replacement for it. Nope. Right? And I believe that that is not just about music. I believe that is about theater. I think it is about anything that brings people together. Um, you know, I spent a lot of time thinking about this over the years because I had a lot of friends who went to the business as the same at the same time as I did, and they came in and they, you know, I was lucky. I wanted to do concerts. I didn't know that it was necessarily future proof or not, but I wanted to do concerts. I had other friends that wanted to make records. Mm -hmm. By the early 2000s, a lot of them are, you know, selling real estate. Okay, so it, that's luck. That's just I had that passion, right? I could have walked up to you know, my professor and said, I want to make albums and I can't find a major for it. Right. Mm -hmm. He probably would have sent me to the music school, but it was, uh, it was amazing to see that for about two, three months in the pandemic, there was this huge rise of live streams, all sorts of, you know, I worked very closely with Global Citizen and they did two huge concerts. They were on every network. It, it, it was amazing. Mm -hmm. But by three or four months in, everyone knew that it had been exhausted, yeah. that the live stream concert was not going to replace the live concert, that sports on television were not going to replace people going to see sports live, that uh, they could have broadcast, you, you could watch Hamilton all you want on Netflix. It's not the same as seeing it, whether it's on Broadway or an off-Broadway production, that from the earliest days of man performing songs and plays and skits for each other, all the way through to, you know, the, you know, the great playwrights of our time and, uh, you know, opera. And you go look at these arts and you go, they're not going away. And that to me is optimism. That says that we're going to go and find a way through this. It's not gonna be a switch. We're not gonna turn it on and we're not gonna turn off the pandemic and suddenly, you know, there, there was a lot of discussion of it's gonna be the roaring twenties. It's gonna be a slow roar. I think people will want to return but they have to feel safe. And that is what we need to return because it's hard to have fun when you feel unsafe. Right. So we have to create a safe atmosphere and a comfortable atmosphere. But when we do, and I've been to a few concerts and uh, I was involved, uh, Global Citizen did the uh, the Vax Live event from California. Mm -hmm. And I was there when, you know, the you know, Jennifer Lopez and the Foo Fighters and uh, Jay Balvin and they took the stage and it was both ways. Right. To look at the artist's face after a year of not being able to perform their art for fans and to get up there and hit the drums and hit the guitar and the fans to be like, oh my God, I haven't been to a show forever and I'm seeing this. Um, it, you know, it, 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 your heart races, you get adrenaline, you're excited, you can't believe this communal moment of us all coming together. And it was, uh, it was the type of thing that when you look back on it, you go, um, it's a fire that can't be extinguished. Well, Mark, I, I tell you that um, that response. I uh, I'm I'm optimistic. I'm hopeful uh, with you. Uh, people need to feel safe in order to really celebrate. In order to really feel like they can be back in 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 spaces with live performances again. I completely agree. Uh, but there's some optimism there. Uh, that I'm, I'm certainly uh, aligned, uh, aligned with you on. Um, we had a, a recently we had the revival for um, Penn State Center Stage, where essentially we brought folks together to see um, excerpts from each of the productions we were going to put the, the Penn State Center Stage will put on this this year. It was among the most refreshing, hopeful, regenerative. Um, optimistic uh, moments I've ever experienced with with a group of people. Still cautious. I mean, there were still masks. Right, we're still. Um, there's something about being with other people in live performance spaces that will never go away. I agree. Absolutely. I agree.
Listen, Mark, I have one final question before we get to a few real quick rapid fire questions. This final question takes us back to this idea that we mentioned early on about advice. And if you would think back to uh, 18, 19, 20 year old Mark, um, what advice would you have for him based on what, what you know now? It's a great question. Uh, see if I can figure out the right way to say this. It, I think I would recommend to myself uh, finding the balance between seeking the counsel of those who are there to advise you and guide you and not taking no for an answer. Uh, I was, I was a little like, uh, I was really, I, well, I, say it, um, I was really firm in that if someone told me no, I just wasn't going to accept it. I was going to go find a way to make it happen and stepped in a lot of toes. And, you know, yes, there were results that came with that, but the nuance of how to work with people and overcome challenges that, you cannot accept the no, but you don't have to steamroll to get there. Mm -hmm. And that is something that took me years to learn. And I had to develop those skills. It, truthfully, it wasn't just the attitude. It was that I didn't know another way. And that there are other ways that the ability to share your vision, to uh, be able to bring people onto your team and get them instead of being uh, obstructionists, but to actually be a uh, you know, a uh, part of the solution versus what you view as the problem. And uh, it took me a while. Um, and I think about that all the time because um, I actually wonder, could I have done more? Yeah. Would would uh, 18 year old Mark have listened to that advice? No. <laughs> <laughs> I like how you were so sure, no. <laughs> like, no. <laughs> He wouldn't have listened because, like you said, he didn't no. didn't necessarily take that those um, I that was, advice. I, yeah, I wasn't listening to anyone. <laughs> oh, Mark, I have so enjoyed this conversation. We we have to find ways to 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 chat again sometime if you'd like. Um, uh, it's, uh, to me, it's been quite refreshing to 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 listen to you and hear hear um, not only about your experience at Penn State, but but. Um, the ins and outs, the twists, the challenges, uh, and the the new the new horizons of of your of your work. Um, so the way I'd like to end things today is like the way I end other interviews. I have a few quick questions and just blurt out your answer as as best you see fit. And I will say they're all related to Penn State. Your your time at Penn State. So that lightning, should be lightning round. Let's do it. Let's go. Here we go. So you may have already alluded to this earlier, but for uh, at the risk of repetition, here we go. Who, who is the one person or who are the people who influenced you the most during your time at Penn State? Uh, that would be uh, Professor Bill Kelly and then my advisor, Carol German, uh, working on moving on, yeah. Great. What was or what is your favorite place on campus? Wow. Uh, I'm gonna say the hub long because that's where we held moving on. And the last time I visited and I walked through there, it was like my head just exploded remembering everything that I did there. And so it's special to me. I don't know that it's the most picturesque or that it was just, but it's special to me. Nice. If there's a standout moment or experience uh, at Penn State, what would that be? And it's okay, moving on can be all of the answers if you'd like. No, I, I'm trying to figure out how many of them should be about football. Um, <laughs> Uh, I would say it was uh, when Penn State beat Michigan in 1994, and even though it was an away game, uh, all the students uh, stormed Beaver Stadium and tore down the goalposts. I'd never seen anything like that. Wow. I, I haven't ever since. It was truly amazing. Wow. So if you imagine yourself back at Penn State uh, and I took you to the creamery, what flavor of ice cream? Uh, coffee break. Okay, there are no incorrect answers to that question. That's a, and uh, uh, there is a, a uh, semi-regular delivery of Penn State, ice, Penn State ice cream to my house still. 
Good for you. Good for you. Where did you live when you were here at Penn State? Uh, I spent two years living on the in the dorms in uh, East Halls, and then uh, a couple years living in a house with a bunch of roommates uh, way out on Beaver Avenue. Okay, great. Last question. Uh, you certainly have already given a uh, response to an advice question that was directed to, you know, young Mark. But what about a piece of advice for uh, an incoming Penn State student? Um, how, what advice would you provide them to set them up for success? Uh, my advice, and I have given this uh, to quite a few students, um, is you know, seek your educational uh, goals and get the most out of your education that you can, but that Penn State, State College, the entire community offers so much more that uh, get involved with student activities, um, find different types of, uh, whether it's arts or uh, groups to collaborate with, that those relationships you build and the experience that you get outside the classroom uh, will take you far as well and not to neglect one for the other and vice versa. You got to do both, but if you walk out with only one, then you haven't really uh, achieved as much as you possibly can. That's great advice. That's great advice. Mark Schulman, thank you so much. It was a pleasure meeting you. I enjoyed talking with you. Uh, thanks for spending time with me today. Thank you. Appreciate being here.